Okay, time to get this shop warmed up. It was about 12 degrees this morning, so frigid, frigid cold. And today is neck carving day. So very excited about that. Always, always love carving the neck. All right, first things first, I can remove the cam clamps that were used to attach the fretboard to the neck blank. And you can see here are the pins that I used to locate the fretboard in the first place. I use a hand drill to pull them out. Okay, let's get started with this. Uh, first, just bring down the bulk of the material on the sides of the fretboard here. This is really like, uh, I don't even consider this carving yet. I don't consider it carving until we're actually contouring the neck. So this is prep work. Doesn't mean it isn't fun though. Look at that. Gorgeous. It smells great too. So my first goal there was just to carve all the excess material away that is outside of the fretboard and the heel cap. And we've just achieved that. So now I'm working on setting the taper for the thickness of the neck blank. And the way that I do that is by carving two troughs at different depths. So there's always a taper in a guitar neck from the nut out to the heel. It starts thin at the nut and gently gets thicker as your hand travels back towards the heel. And so here I'm just using a round rasp to cut those troughs. Before I start carving and contouring on the neck shaft, I'm gonna do some preliminary shaping around the cheeks of the headstock and around the heel. Once I've done a little bit of shaping to those two areas, I can then turn my attention to the neck shaft. Here I'm using a spoke shave to carve the many facets that will make up the contour of my neck. Then I return to shaping the heel and shaping the cheeks of the headstock and eventually back to the neck shaft again, then back to the heel, back to the cheeks of the headstock. And really it's just a dance between these three areas. I never want to take any one of these areas all the way to completion all at once. What I want to do is maintain an equilibrium between those areas so one of those areas is never getting too far ahead of the others. So one thing I always keep around for the neck carving process is this Velcro backed 40 grit sandpaper. The reason I keep this around is actually because it's what I use um, well, not the 40 grit, actually, that's a little too gritty, but it's what I use on my drum sander. I use 100 grit. Uh, 40 grit is just too much, but 40 grit is perfect for this. So I order extra Velcro backed sandpaper in the 40 grit because it is one of the best tools I find for neck carving. I don't use it for the bulk of the process. What you saw me doing with the Shinto rasp and the spoke shave and the planes and the chisels. That's the majority of the work here, but using the 40 grit Velcro backed sandpaper in this fashion 
held taut at the sides like this. So I'm not taking it and pressing it in with my thumbs. I'm holding, my hands are outside on the edges and I'm just allowing the paper to wrap around the contour of the neck and it's going to clean up all the inconsistencies uh, from the handwork that I'm doing. And it's gonna really level everything out. And I like to pull this out every once in a while just to sort of give myself a reality check and see where I actually stand on here and make sure I'm not getting any severely low spots or anything like that. So this just cleans it up every once in a while. Check it out. And it does it super quick because it's 40 grit. I can use this a little bit on the heel here. Just because of my heel shape, you wouldn't be able to do this on a pointy heel, of course. But if I do that too much, I'll get this little smiley face mark, this indentation from the paper where the paper ends, I'll get that indentation at the bottom. So I don't spend too much time on the heel with this. This is mostly for the shaft. All right, let's return to the other tools. Before I attach the neck, I like to give a nice 220 grit sanding to the areas around the fretboard tongue and around the heel since once the neck is attached, these areas will be more difficult to finish sand later on. So we're kind of taking care of that ahead of time. And now I can go ahead and spread the glue onto the fretboard tongue. There will be no glue in the joint itself because this is a mortise and tenon bolt-on neck joint. The beauty of a bolt-on mortise and tenon joint is that the joint is semi-permanent, meaning that it actually can be, with a little bit of difficulty, removed later on to make adjustments to the neck fit, which, even on a well-made guitar after, say, 40 years, they often need a neck reset. Other joints that include glue in the joint itself are far more difficult to remove for a neck reset and often involve damage to the instrument itself during the removal process. This is why I believe personally that the Balton mortise and tenon really is the superior neck joint. All right, good morning guys. Check this out. It is really starting to look like a guitar now. So I just finished all the neck carving here. One thing that I've always noticed about Port Orford Cedar that I don't like, it's just a difficult thing to deal with, is it's very easy to get, especially in the end grain of the heel, uh, ebony dust stuck in those pores and it's very hard to get it out. Basically you just have to sand in one direction pulling off of the heel cap rather than in from it. And it takes time and it's slow, uh, all in order to clean this mess up that you see here, all this black stuff. But it will clean up, it's just annoying. But otherwise, I love Port Orford Cedar. And great, so now the neck and the body are one in the neck joint here. I only have glue under the fretboard tongue. That's normal for a, uh, bolt-on mortise and tenon joint to not have glue in here. Although I just started adding, 
is the first guitar I've ever done this on, and I don't know that, I'm not necessarily recommending this, but I added a dot of glue on both corners of the heel cap here, just for a little extra insurance. And uh, it's kind of a might as well thing in my mind, because you already have to, to remove this joint, you have to loosen the glue, soften the glue up under the fretboard tongue, and that's by far the hardest part about removing the neck from the body. Uh, having the additional problem of having to loosen up the glue on these two corners. Well, if you can do that here, it's very easy to do that if I just put a little dot there and there. So I don't think it's any, it makes the neck removal process any messier or any more difficult. And it is just a little bit of extra insurance. Not that I've ever had the, the bolt pull out or the, the brass insert pull out of the wood or anything like that, but it could happen. So anyway, uh, I don't know if I'm always going to do that, but I'm thinking about it. All right, let's move on to the next thing, which is radius sanding the fretboard. By the way, since this guitar is a short scale guitar, and let me explain why that's important, first of all, a short scale guitar is going to have looser strings, all things the same. So when it's tuned up to the same pitch, all the strings are tuned to the same pitch as a long scale guitar. These strings are going to feel looser, which allows for more, uh, more of a lead style of playing, more bending of notes and things like that. So, because I want to build this guitar as more of a lead guitar and less of a just plain chord strummer, although you can do that too, I'm going to give it a pretty flat radius. This is a 20 inch radius, which is about as flat as radii for fretboards get before they become just dead flat, which is what you would see on say a classical guitar. This is a steel string guitar, so we are gonna put a radius on it. It's just going to not be a very curved radius like you might see on a old fender or something like that, which would be the 7.25 inch radius. Uh, really, if you want a guitar that plays well, uh, doesn't note out when you're bending notes and playing lead, anything from like a 12 inch up is probably a good radius to have. 16 is, is a good sort of middling radius in that sense where you can still play a lot of really great lead uh, but the chords, playing chords still feels pretty comfortable because there's some amount of radius on there. You can think of the radius this way. The more curvature, curvature you have, the easier chords are. The less curvature you have, the flatter it is, the easier lead playing and bending of notes is because the fretboard doesn't have this big hump in the middle. So when you're bending the note, it's less likely to note out against the fret wire as the fret wire is coming up over that hump. So once again, more curvature, easier chord playing, less curvature, better lead playing. We are going with less curvature, better lead playing. And that's the 20 inch radius. And now for something exceptionally tedious, the radius sanding. So this takes me the better part of a full day, including applying the fall away to the fretboard tongue. Once I have the fence set up and I get going with it, it's a pretty mindless task. So a good time to just kind of let your mind wander, perhaps listen to some good music or a podcast, or maybe watch some old episodes of DIY guitar making. Whatever keeps you sane during this task.
This is, by the way, what I mean by the fall away. The fretboard is dead flat except for the fretboard tongue where there is a very, very, very slight gap. I can fit this thousandth of an inch feeler gauge underneath. This is because relief in the neck is actually desirable and relief along most of the length of the neck is achieved by the tension of the strings pulling the neck into a small amount of relief. However, the fretboard tongue is not a part of the neck. It is not a part of that dynamic system. It is fastened securely to the sound box. So it cannot move. So therefore we just manually fudge in that tiny amount of fall away by sanding. Okay guys, so the fretboard radius is complete. I've established a 20 inch radius across, which is nice and subtle. I've also installed my fret marker dots there, and they look nice. And I've smoothed this whole board out to 320 grit. So that's why it looks nice and glassy right now. So now, with all of that done, all of that tedious work, because it is pretty exceptionally tedious to apply that radius to the board, now we're gonna switch focus to fretting. So it's a pretty standard fret job here, at least standard for me. I'm using the Evo Gold fret wire that I love so much and a 20 inch radius for the fretboard. The Evo Gold comes pre-bent so that makes things a little bit easier. And here I'm just cutting the wire into individual segments for each fret slot. And then I'm using a needle file to give each fret slot a slight bevel. What this does is it mitigates the problem of chip out. When you hammer in your frets, and especially if you remove fret wire, you risk getting chip out on your board, which is especially pronounced on ebony, which this is. So it's always a good idea to just bevel those slots and you'll get less or hopefully no chip out. So I just finished the bevels here. This still feels pretty sharp, which is expected at this point. So what I'm gonna be doing next is with this little tool right here, this little needle file, I'm going to be taking the burrs, which is why they feel sharp, taking the burrs off of each fret end here with a simple fluid motion that looks something like this. There we go. That's one down. Let's do the rest. Here I'm simply using 4 aught steel wool to polish the frets and the fretboard all at once. And this is where I'm going to leave you guys off until the next episode in this series on building guitar number 85. See you in the next one. If you learned something here, please give this video a like and subscribe so you can be notified when I release a new DIY guitar making video. And if you want to really learn more, take one of my structured online courses at ericschaferguitars.com or register for a hands-on guitar building workshop here with me in Burnville, Pennsylvania.